for today is Chief Marketing Officer of Sepio Systems and one of its co-founders. He has a strong intelligent community background and has more than 25 years of experience in electri electrical engineering and an MBA graduate. He is definitely an expert on rogue device detention and supply chain attacks. He is Ben Benatar. Thank you very much, Erika. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining in. I'm happy that uh, you all uh, managed to, uh, to attend this uh, webinar. I can assure you that uh, we are very tolerant to background noise like uh, kids uh, barking doors, couriers knocking at the door and everything that comes with teleworking in these days. Uh, as Erica uh, mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders for, uh, for Sepia Systems and I'll be doing you what hopefully will be an interesting uh, a brief or a break from uh, today's uh, activities, uh, going through various uh, ATM attack trends, rogue devices, a couple of a uh, couple of demos uh, where I would like to emphasize that uh, these demos are mainly intended to spark your imagination by giving you some uh, some teaspoon taste of, uh, of what these devices can uh, can actually do, and then you can let your mind uh, free to go and uh, decide what type of uh, additional payloads or scripts you can uh, you can think of. Before uh, before we start, uh, I would like to, uh, to actually go through why why we are all here, and I've decided to go with uh, with one of our uh, animated figures, which is Captain RDM. And the first episode that we actually did was with uh, regards to a uh, uh, rock devices and uh, it's a short video, so we'll uh, let it play, and hopefully that will uh, resonate with the reason while you are here. Okay, so that was uh, that was our first uh, motivation for a, a for our session, and uh, two things that we've uh, that we've learned post post this video is the first thing that not all criminals have a missing uh, tooth, and but the second thing is that attackers wherever they are are always smart and they are always innovative in the way they address the various uh, obstacles that we as a as a security industry are trying to uh, to put before uh, before them, a brief uh, brief intro about the the company. So we'll we'll get the background and the, the understanding of where do we come with the presumption to uh, handle these uh, uh, these challenges. So Sefi was founded in mid 2016. Uh, the core founding members, which is myself and uh, uh, several others, we've been working together for uh, well over 29 years. We're headquartered in Rockville, Maryland, and we have two R&D facilities in Tel Aviv and Lisbon. Uh, our solution, which we'll I'll, uh, give a couple of words later on, can be run as a SaaS or an on-prem solution. And most of our customers come from the uh, financial critical infrastructure, uh, mainly based in uh, North America, Europe, and the APAC region. Uh, going over our uh, board members and the people behind the company, so actually you, you, as you probably can see, most of them are veterans from the intelligence community because rock devices actually started as a kind of a, a coverted James Bond type of applications. And uh, 
moving through the years as technology progressed and more state level tools were actually miniaturized and offered to the public uh, uh, for the public use uh, people from that community whether it's the former director for the israeli mossad the former CISO for the cia various executives from the uh, dod nsa and others have joined the have joined sepio with bringing vast experience both from the uh, operational aspects and from the technology aspects required to handle those uh, those challenges now going into business so the atm uh, atm attacks trends uh, you know went through a, an evolution period the, the evolution period obviously started with the, with dynamite in some places that's still the case case where people blow up uh, a, atms or they they bring in a jeep to uh, inside a mall and try to tow uh, the safe or the atm itself from the from inside the mall it is then evaluated evolution to another uh, to another uh, phase where electronics came into uh, into place and then we've seen a lot of card skimmers or card shimmers and with various say electromechanical solutions which again were very innovative very uh, smart in the way they were deployed and they extremely coverted and it is uh, sometimes sheer luck the way people can actually detect those uh, uh, rogue uh, rogue plates then we moved into some uh, more deeper electronics, uh, mainly various uh, black boxes or uh, various bypassing uh, relays that allow the attackers to actually bypass original uh, USB connections and route them in direct uh, direct signals into the uh, dispensers or to other components within the ATM. And then we we've come to this one. So this one is uh, is exceptional because again going back to the fact that attackers are always innovative is that when they found that the people are closing and keeping a, a tighter security on their on their atm so now it's it's more difficult for them you know just to uh, gain physical access to the internal of the of the atm and plug a a bluetooth keyboard dongle or place a, a black box or something like that and so they've identified the next uh, weak point. And the next weak point was the network interface that in most cases uh, is run in unprotected uh, a cable duct or uh, you know, in malls, you could see it somewhere lying at the, at the back. So in most cases, the network cable that's connected externally to the ATM is very accessible. And that provides a, a, an ease of operation or a more flexibility in operations where the attacker can decide his place of uh, battle because instead of doing running all these attacks just next under the suspecting eyes of the uh, of the cctv or any other uh, physical security measures he can follow the cable and then intercept the cable somewhere along the way and by doing that and i'll do um, uh, one of the demos actually shows um, a, a setup like this uh, you can actually run a full many the middle attack without being picked up by any of the existing uh, security network security products because everything that they do, they do on the physical layer. Now, currently all existing cybersecurity uh, network products have visibility from layer two and above. That means that they need to tap into the Mac or have some Mac uh, related to a given, uh, given entity, and then they will follow up on that uh, Mac. But the attackers understood that, and they've uh, gone one layer deeper into the physical layer, and they found a variety of devices that allows them a, an easy access to the network by doing everything on the physical layer and you will uh, see it in one of the coming uh, coming demos now when talking about atm attack trends so i think if you if we try to give a, a kind of a header to to various years i think 2018 was the year of payment transfer haste so we've seen a lot of those in the with very large numbers we've seen 120 million in in mexico we've seen uh, 30 millions in India. We've seen a lot of uh, payment uh, payment hastes uh, over there. 2019 brought in, uh, I think, a surge of uh, of ATM attacks. So uh, we've seen attacks in Kenya and in other places in, in the world uh, where ATMs were uh, considerably getting uh, under under attack. And we've uh, we've tried to understand uh, understand why. And I think that one of the main reasons for that is because of the uh, the U.S. Department of uh, Treasury, because I think that because of the various uh, measures taken by the national illicit uh, finance strategy 
it is extremely difficult for the cybercrime organization or for the state-sponsored activity to run around with the considerable funds around the world and try to uh, uh, to laundry them and and make them legal so that they could actually cash out on their on their cybercrime activities. In the ATM, it's more of a tactical uh, solution because you can actually get the immediate uh, Las Vegas effect uh, of cashing out in local uh, currency. So even if you go and, and examine scenarios where you, you're trying to fund uh, a, a terrorism a, a activity, so instead of trying to move around the world with various uh, transactions going through uh, dubious uh, countries, you can actually provide them with the tools, which in most cases they are like less than $100, provide them with the know-how, and then they can generate their own income flow from the domestic uh, ATMs that uh, they can easily find in their in their locations. So I think that this is, uh, again, for our on our opinion, this is the reason that why ATM attacks are becoming more and more popular, and we've seen less uh, of the large payment transfer haste, but I could be tomorrow morning, we could all wake up and discover that I was wrong. When looking into 2020, so obviously the fact that major parts of the world are going into a significant recessions obviously brings the issue of a criminal activity into the spotlight. So if I would need to guess, I would guess that 2020 will also be a, a bad year for ATM operators and a good year for a ATM attackers. But this is still yet to be seen. We also need to uh, take into account that because of the uh, social uh, social distancing and the fact that there are less people on the street uh, allows a more feel, feeling of security for those attackers where they can uh, uh, wander the streets, uh, in most cases being un, uh, unattended uh, by the law enforcement uh, personnel as well. So why, uh, why, ROG, uh, why ROG devices? ROG devices exploit specific vulnerabilities. These are not new vulnerabilities because these vulnerabilities have been known for some of them have been known for for many years but they are still uh, unattended so the first one is i've uh, mentioned er earlier is the layer one network implants that means that if you can carry your attack on the physical layer as if it was a a back-to-back -back fire connection or if is if it is was a, a passive cable then the upper security layers will not be aware of that because from their perspective and from the switches perspective you know, you've just connected a, a 30 centimeter cable or a one meter cable. So obviously there's nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's totally legitimate. While in real life, this cable is actually a virtual cable that builds a VPN over a cellular, a cellular connection. One of the most, uh, I think, popular and most infamous devices within this domain is a, is a very cool device from a, a cool company. The device is a legitimate device for legitimate purposes. Uh, and, and the company is uh, a legitimate company, but the attackers understood that it has a special feature, uh, which is VCM mode. And uh, the original purpose for that device was to actually provide a, a central branch with the satellite branch, have them connected with the, with low IT overhead, so that you would place one dongle in one side with a solar dongle, and then you'll place another dongle at the satellite branch and they would create a seamless cable so that you could actually manage all your IT with a flattened IP scheme and as if they were connected with a very long cable. And this feature allowed the attackers to tap on, uh, on that capability and create their own switchboard and manipulate the data as they see, as they see fit. So the physical layer, that's the vulnerable uh, soft belly on the, on the network side. When we move into the uh, peripheral side, then obviously, all those uh, HID devices uh, still pose a significant, uh, significant threat. And in this case, again, the attackers are becoming very, very smart and very uh, innovative. So obviously, they, when they would plug their uh, HID, and I will discuss about that in a minute, when they plug in their HID device, which could be a rubber ducky or a TZ or a Ninja or a Samurai cable uh, or any other type of a USB HID emulator, they will impersonate as a legitimate uh, as a legitimate device with the same characteristics of uh, of that legitimate uh, keyboard or dispenser or any part of a USB peripheral that takes uh, place in the uh, takes part in the ATM construction. And once they're done that, that means that you cannot 
you can no longer whitelist uh, the devices only according to those uh, parameters because they, there's an ambiguity in those parameters and attackers take that to their advantage. And obviously there are, there's a huge amount of, uh, of attack tools which are based on various variants of the HID, rubber ducky and, and so on, uh, which uh, we'll demo again uh, shortly. And of course, the, the holy grail for that will be the supply chain. Obviously, if you can own the supply chain, and owning the supply chain could be a, having a, an accomplice in the courier company, in the warehouse, uh, a warehouse of the system integrator that provides the various components for the, for the ATM, or even uh, someone in the harbor that, that un unloads uh, a ATMs from a container coming from, uh, from overseas. All these vulnerable points uh, needs to be needs to be secured uh, because once the implant or the the attack tool is well concealed inside the the atm itself it will be extremely difficult uh, to detect its uh, its existence and in most cases attackers understand that the, it is easier like the original trojan uh, trojan horse it is easier to uh, uh, to get this part of the supply chain into the enterprise's assets than you could come in in greater numbers and then trying to force your way into uh, specific ATMs and having uh, the the requirement to to challenge each and every ATM for its uh, master key and for the local uh, accomplice or or things like that. And I guess supply chain attacks comes in various uh, in various ways. Uh, it could come from the aftermarket. It could come from the original vendor. It could come from uh, the entire supply chain path that the device goes through. Now the, the main question is, is it that easy? Well, the, the answer unfortunately is yes. And uh, here is a, a very short menu of uh, various uh, devices that we've uh, that we've seen uh, that we've seen around the world. Uh, so the one from the last picture that uh, that you've seen is uh, is from uh, from GLI Net, so the the yellow one that you can actually buy on Amazon for twenty five dollars. As you can see, most of these uh, devices can be purchased at the at the open market. You don't have to go into the darkness for that. You don't need to go to a dark alley and swap an egg or something like uh, romantic like that. All the devices are extremely accessible and extremely available for all uh, for all parties uh, concerned. And they are divided into two main groups. There's the USB attack tools and there's the network implants. So if you look at into the rubber ducky, the cactus weed, the TZ. And obviously the various variants of Raspberry Pi uh, uh, Zero and Zero W, uh, they are the most uh, dominant one in the in the USB domain. Uh, one one device worth mentioning is the USB Ninja cable. And again, this shows you how these guys work because a couple of years ago, if you if you recall, there was one of the major WikiLeaks uh, uh, dump that uh, uh, people. Uh, uh, people were exposed to the fact that the, there was an NSA uh, toolkit, uh, and one of the devices there was a uh, was called Cottonmouth, which was a, a manipulated uh, USB keyboard that had a, a wireless USB uh, transceiver in its uh, molded into that USB Type A connector. So now, a couple of years later, you can have the same functionality for $89, uh, encapsulated as a USB Ninja cable. All the electronics is molded into that USB Type A connector, and you can do a hell lot of things with that device. And and now you can no longer assume that you need to see a certain uh, printed circuit board inside the, the ATM in order to uh, uh, to see that there's a, an implant inside the the ATM because it could actually be in the cabling itself inside the inside the ATM, which will be extremely difficult to detect because these cable uh, unless the attacker is in its uh, proximity, will act as a completely passive cable without any indication that it's uh, it's malicious. And then going to the to the network part, so there's a picture of this uh, Pocket Port 2 device. Uh, there's the Plunderbug, which is a, a kind of a tap, a GLINet, Packet Score. All of these devices have a mode that allows them to be completely transparent network-wise. Uh, for example, if we'll take the GLINet, which uh, is originally a kind of a MIFI, a kind of a traveling companion. So this device, as a, you put it in line, a cable going in, cable going out, a, it is placed a, a, in line, and the exfiltration or the C2 connection is done through a USB 
cellular dongle or any type of other uh, connection. It could be a LoRa or a, a Wi-Fi or whatever works for that specific uh, use case, and the exfiltration will be done through there. Now, for those, uh, obviously, the the GLI it doesn't come as a as an equipped attack tool right off of Amazon. So you need to go through a very known uh, hacker's website called Google, and you'll do a GLI net IP slash max spoofing, and then you will find a very nice payload called uh, SlimShim that actually uh, runs on that specific uh, platform. And again, you don't have to be the brightest engineers uh, in order to accomplish uh, that. And then you all you need to do is to find a nice spot. Sometimes the ATM network cable routes on the rooftop or any other unprotected media, and then you can uh, select your place of the battle there and no one will, will ever know that you're there. Okay, so now it's uh, time for uh, to play a little bit with the with the demos. So uh, now that's the logistics uh, part. So I hope all of you can, uh, can see that. So I'll explain, uh, I'll first explain about the setup. So uh, my laptop is connected through a, a network cable that goes uh, here. This network cable is connected to a, the first a pocket port uh, device. It is then coupled with a cellular dongle, and then it is connected back to the original uh, to the original switch, which is a, an untampered Cisco switch. Again, with a second a second cellular dongle, a, a second pocket port, and then to the original switch. Now, from the a perspective of the switch, this is a, a passive a, a passive cable. So let me show you how the switch actually sees this entire setup. So we'll uh, we'll go into the switch itself. Okay, so I will be using the uh, the show MAC address table command. Okay, so that command actually brings from the switch all the MAC addresses that are connected to it. Now, as you can see, the only MAC address that the switch sees is a, a device with the MAC address starting with the 98 FA, uh, something like that, which is surprisingly enough, let's do this. So surprisingly enough, it's the uh, MAC address of my uh, of my machine. So that means that this entire setup, where the the data now flows over a cellular network and then back to the to your original switch, is completely invisible to the switch itself. So that means that all the security applications that rely on the switch for their uh, initial source for uh, for MAC addresses or things like that will be completely invisible for that. Now that also means that there won't be any suspicious MAC addresses in the uh, uh, in the network because there will be only legitimate MAC addresses. Now, usually, what the attacker will do is that they will first go, as we as we like to say, they will first go right and attack the 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 host itself. And once they've uh, they've extracted various keys or hashes or or other relevant information, then they will go uh, left and uh, try to propagate through the switch itself. Now, another key thing is that once they're inside the network, then they examine the switches. And then, for example, if they see that one of the uh, port uh, is configured as a, a port mirror, that means that it's probably used for uh, monitoring or maybe for evasive solutions. So they could actually tamper with that as well and make sure that their malicious uh, activity or suspicious activity will be kept out of, uh, out of sight. Uh, and again, this could be done for a, for every network connection. You could actually, there's a nice uh, demo where you could actually place this setup in line to a network printer. And then uh, you could send out a file that includes a list of 10 IBANs, and then you can uh, intercept that and change the IBAN code of the fifth transaction. And then the hard copy that will actually be generated uh, will be completely different 
or at least that one row will be completely different from the from the original file that was uh, sent out for printout. And you know, it it takes a lot of uh, a lot of suspecting eyes in order to uh, to detect those uh, those type of uh, in some cases minor impairments. So going into the into the next uh, into the next demo. Uh, so what I want to show you now, and uh, let's go to the screen. Yeah. Okay. So this is a this device is called a, a DigiSpark. This is a, I think about one and a half euro device. A very simple, a, very simple to use. A, you can program it using Arduino. There's like a bunch of tutorials that uh, can guide you through. And uh, I will be using this uh, this device to show you a, a sample of a of a ransomware ransomware campaign. And again, I'm running a an endpoint. Actually, I'm running a couple of endpoints on my on my machine. Uh, from various known vendors and before I do that I'll again for the sake of, uh, uh, of not providing uh, the actual uh, details you see that I've created a, a text file called uh, a sepio, sepio test uh, with this uh, text ATM uh, webinar and let's close this one and now I'll plug this in Now this device will uh, is configured to uh, as a as a Dell uh, as a Dell keyboard. Sorry, let me do this for a minute. Sorry. Okay, we're good to go. Now, as you can see, uh, again, we're running everything uh, openly, so we could actually see the the encryption uh, the encryption key. And this payload actually takes a file called uh, sepiotest.txt uh, from uh, from the documents folder and cre encrypts it and creates a sepiotest underscore encrypted. I'm not using any PowerShells or any any fancy commands here. Uh, once the once the attack has ended, so you actually, oh, we can't see it here. So there, there's actually a second LED blinking, uh, blinking on my uh, on my screen. And then if we'll go uh, to that, uh, you'll see that there's now, Sepio test has now been renamed as Sepio test encrypted. And now you see that everything is now in, uh, in gibberish. So uh, again, obviously you understand where you can take this uh, to other, uh, a, to other scenarios and other uh, implications. Now, another one that I want to I want to show, and uh, I think this I think this is one of my uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is the Ninja cable. Okay, so again, all the electronics is uh, is here. Uh, so you know you could easily uh, house it as a legitimate uh, internal cabling. So you could you can cut this, make it as according to the uh, relevant wiring that you require. It works actually as a as a as a high quality charging cable, and when I'll plug this in, so first of all you'll see that nothing happens because this uh, it doesn't have to be connected to anything. The way it works is that you need the attacker connected to it remotely. So there's a there's a special app for it. Hopefully you can see it, but there's a list of all the uh, devices that uh, uh, that are in its uh, proximity. So I'll select uh, I'll select Ninja. And then uh, you'll see there's a, a various uh, buttons that I can use. And before I'll press the, one of the keys, one of the pushbacks that we get from some time to time is that the fact that it is extremely difficult to extricate information from enterprises network. So in this case, again, the the intended use now is I'll show it on a standard uh, enterprise network, but you can understand where you can take it from ATMs. So we can actually exfiltrate information by using existing uh, external websites, 
And in this case, I will actually exfiltrate the information by posting it as a, as a remark on a YouTube channel. Now, if there are any Real Madrid scouters here in the audience, so the, the one that will shortly dribble is my son. So you'll see that the, there's a tab going over the various options. And then it goes to the text. And then I've exfiltrated the information as the comment. Now, because uh, because a lot of uh, uh, enterprises block various websites, but they in most cases they do keep the uh, YouTube channels, LinkedIn news uh, uh, news channels open where you can actually place comments. So you could actually use them in order to exfiltrate information. So again, these uh, these examples are again to to get you acquainted with some of the capabilities, and then obviously you can uh, you know. Probably a lot of you are already experienced, and you can understand where you can take this into the into the ATM domain. Now, obviously, the the ATM uh, ecosystem uh, lives below radar as well. So we're still seeing a lot of uh, uh, specific payloads and uh, services being offered uh, under the radar on the various uh, uh, forums and markets in the in the darknet. Uh, so you can buy almost anything uh, out there. Uh, you just need to have the the relevant uh, the relevant funds and some basic uh, basic know-how, and you can uh, use those very sophisticated tools, whether these are ATM malwares or specific uh, HID payloads that are extremely uh, extremely efficient in uh, in hiding themselves or creating various backdoors into the ATMs uh, quite easily, and in most cases very uh, very cheaply. The the second thing is the supply chain risk. So that's a that's one of the coolest way for you to uh, to hack into uh, into an ATM because now you as an attacker you can uh, you can buy a stock of uh, of refurbished or uh, or supplies from the from the original vendor. Uh, you can then manipulate and implant them uh, in your lab and then send them back to the to the market for the aftermarket uh, repairs. And then that means that you can actually conceal your uh, your device within those uh, printers or within those keyboards, and it would look uh, as if they, uh, they they are original devices. You you will feel very very comfortable with them because uh, uh, they came with the original packaging and everything. So uh, we need to be very very aware of those uh, of those channels because uh, once they're in, you can actually implant them with uh, some. Uh, a, cellular communication which are extremely miniature so you will actually know the gps coordinates of uh, where this uh, a spare part actually ended up in and then once you'll have its address then you can come on with a with a cell phone and uh, and do the las vegas uh, uh, effect whether through a cash spinning or or jackpotting so this is something that we also uh, seen happening uh, around the world and uh, where, what we do what are we doing about it so uh, as i've as i've mentioned the the way we place ourselves so we place ourselves at the physical layer everything that we do is on the physical layers because the physical layer is the only place that uh, you cannot tamper with you cannot tamper with the uh, time you cannot tamper uh, with uh, with specific physical layer characteristics uh, because trying to warp them and rewarp them to their original uh, parameters sometimes it's a uh, it's physically uh, impossible. So we operate at the physical layer. And we do that with two, uh, two ways. The first is through the network part and the second covers the peripheral part. So the network part is that we actually pull all the physical layer information uh, from the uh, switch that the ATMs are connected to. We read all the fire related uh, information. So those will be various registers and eye patterns and uh, a, the POE parameters and everything that has to do timing and so on, everything that has to do with the physical layer characteristics. So we're not interested in traffic or in the log files or anything that has to do with actual data. And then we we use a, a, an algorithm which is a combination of a fingerprinting and a machine learning based algorithm. The fingerprinting is a is a is a model that actually allows us to name the attack tool. So when we get a hit on the fingerprinting, we can actually tell you, okay, someone implanted a Raspberry Pi three or a Raspberry Pi 4 running in the transparent mode or a bridge mode, 
uh, if someone plays a packet squirrel or a, a, any other type of a plunder bug or any type of an implant, or it could be even a passive tap for that matter. Now, obviously, we cannot assume that we're familiar with all with all the devices because some of them are home brewed. So that's where the machine learning kicks in. So it will analyze the entire physical layer of the entire infrastructure, and then it will divide it into various clusters according to their physical layer characteristics. And once they, for example, we see 100 uh, ATM machines that are uh, it could be distributed over three separate uh, physical layer cl characteristic clusters, and then we see two ATMs that are completely off cluster, then we know that there is something there. We cannot name the attack tool, but we know that there is something there. The second part deals with the with going intimacy into the USB interface and understanding the physical layer characteristics of what's actually connected. So again, we fingerprint the device. So actually, there's a, a different fingerprinting when you connect a, a, a USB rubber ducky or a TZ or any or a Raspberry Pi, or when you impersonating it, let's say as a as an ATM keyboard, uh, compared with the original uh, uh, with the original ATM keyboard. So what we do is we analyze every connection on three aspects, the physical layer, the interfaces, and the behavioral of that. And then we can actually detect the existence of such, a, of such devices, even if they are fully uh, identical to the, completely identical to the legitimate device with respect to their vendor ID, product ID, class ID, everything that has to do with the logical parameters of that device. And once uh, those are detected, uh, obviously you can, uh, you can block those ports and uh, and alert through the northbound interface whether to the SIM solutions or for the uh, business process uh, monitoring which I will also uh, elaborate in a, in a minute. So the fact that we're doing it on a physical layer makes the, the life of the attackers more uh, more hard. Uh, like always you know the honest answer when people uh, will people ask us okay if I buy if I buy this does that mean that I'm 100% secured? So the honest answer will be no, because uh, there isn't anything like 100% 100 secured. There is only comparable security. That means that you can say, okay, I'm I'm better than the than the other bank. I'm better than the other ATM operator. So that when the attackers uh, come and try to evaluate their next potential uh, potential target, you want to make sure that you're more secure than security hardened than the competitor so that they will go with the competitor and in that sense you know it's like the joke that you know you don't have to be just saying bolt in order to outrun a tag you just need to be faster than the guy running next to you uh, it is a never ending uh, battle as i mentioned these guys we we have a lot of respect for those guys in the sense a uh, uh, technical respect in the sense that they always find those uh, those unmonitored uh, points that you know no one th thought about and uh, they go in, in through that, and it's a cat and mouse game, uh, and it will be continue to do uh, to be so. And sometimes we win, sometimes they win, and uh, but in overall, I think that we're getting into a, a, a much secured place than we've been in the last couple of years. Uh, one of the things uh, is you know that needs to, to be brought into mind is the fact that at the end, when you're a bank and you're operating an ATM your main goal is not to have a protected ATM. Your main goal is to provide ATM service for your customers. And in that sense, the, a, having an overall holistic approach to the actual required delivery from the, for the ATM, which also includes both the cyber a, aspects and other aspects as well, is something is, that is very crucial. And I want to show a, one of the a, test cases that we did for a, a, in the EMEA region. Uh, with our good friends from uh, from Centerity. And uh, what we do here is we provide the, the holistic approach. That means that you as a manager or as an ATM operator, you want to have, at the end of the day, you want to know, are we good or not? Are we Do we have a, a sufficient uh, be above threshold uh, service level for our, for our customers? And that service level is, a, is an aggregated result from a, from the devices themselves, from the cyber security aspects, from the electricity, everything that has uh, has taken part in the overall process of creating the full flow of ATM uh, ATM service. So that at the end of the day, the the customers or the the IT team or the security team will have an overview of what's actually happening. I think that's something that 
uh, managers uh, and directors really, really appreciate because then they could have a very simple uh, gag method that aggregates the entire layers below that. Because from their perspective, you know, from the from the operational aspect, you know, it's it's good for them to know if it's a, a rubber ducky or a Raspberry Pi. But at the end of the day, they want to know how does it affect their overall performance and business continuity. And then there's various uh, various KPIs and various uh, methods that. Uh, parameters that we're that we're looking at. So obviously we're looking at the the physical layer. So everything that has to do with bypassing and the rock peripherals. And then there's like a specific uh, information which is related to uh, to the ATM itself. Where it's sometimes it's a third party information that it is uh, it is not accessible. So you obviously you want to know if there's a printer failures. If you want to know if someone opened the cabinet door or things like that. Or if it's uh, related to the account or to the logical parameters, whether they are stolen cards or or other analytical uh, KPIs with regards to uh, the overflow of the the overall flow of the of the process. And I, I think that this holistic approach, where at the end of the day you get one or maybe two uh, gigs that actually show show you, okay, are we in the green area? Are we in the red area? Uh, provides more visibility and. Uh, and more confidence in the performance of the overall uh, the overall uh, ATM service, and not just the each and every block within within that chain. So before uh, so now that you're a, a ATM RDM expert, so uh, now we can go and see how the uh, the story ends. So the last time uh, we got uh, uh, the ATM uh, uh, the CISO got fired. Uh, so this is a kind of a tribute. To the uh, to the original uh, uh, Superman movie. So um, with regards to that, before I I hand it back uh, to uh, to Erica, I thank you very much for your uh, for your attention and audience. Feel free to uh, to approach us. Feel free to use any of the videos that you've seen that are posted in YouTube. Feel free to use them for training purposes. There are uh, additional use cases there. Uh, so feel free to use them. Uh, if you have any inquiries, uh, we'll be happy. Uh, we'll be happy to communicate with you. And let uh, let's save this uh, fourth guy job, and let it run for the last couple of uh, seconds. So it doesn't always end with a with a police car, and it doesn't always end with a, a CISO of the Year award. Uh, but again, we're aiming at uh, providing a, a more secured, a secured environment uh, for you and for your uh, for your customers. So thank you very much, and uh, Erica. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ben. That was a very uh, informative uh, webinar. I'm sure um, everyone would agree. Uh, with me, we've got a couple of questions that I've um, I collected uh, during the webinar. The first one, Ben um, says, "What's the competitive edge over Dark Trace?" So I think the competitive edge would be the the fact that we actually go uh, go into the physical uh, to the physical layer uh, of things. So we're actually, uh, so to speak, looking into the electronics of uh, of things. Uh, and this is part of our, our background where we come from. Uh, most of us are electrical engineers and not a bachelor in, uh, in computer science. So we came from the electronics uh, and the hardware aspects of things. And uh, knowing how the attackers uh, operate and work, uh, together with this under deep understanding of the hardware uh, layer, allows us this, uh, this competitive edge of going into the physical layer. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, and so, in um, in summary, Ben, what are the key issues that one should consider when hardening their cyber physical security? So, so as you as you see, in the the security of the ATM starts uh, well before the the ATM is actually installed and deployed. So, uh, obviously, uh, having a, a qualified uh, supply uh, supply chain, having reliable uh, partners throughout the process. Uh, making sure that you know exactly uh, which part came from uh, from which uh, from which vendor and so on. Uh, this would be a, a minimum uh, basic. 
Uh, for more sensitive uh, installation, you can even go uh, uh, deeper than that and use other supply chain verification uh, methods, whether like they are AOI screening or X-ray screening. And then going into the issue of uh, making sure that you're well protected against uh, all those uh, gadgets and uh, peripherals that are out there. And first of all, making sure that you you test them before you, you deploy the ATMs, because obviously once they've deployed, then it's a, it's a hell of a nightmare to have them uh, uh, reserviced. Uh, so you know, running a, a sandboxing environment, acquiring these tools, they are not they are not difficult uh, to master. So having your own uh, attack uh, attack kit, you don't need an external red team for that. You can uh, you can set up this uh, this tool. You can uh, contact us. We can give you some of the links for for the various uh, equipment, uh, and then you can test uh, and see if your security measures that you've currently installed are good enough or not. And then you can decide which part of the solution you want to harden. You also need to have a very solid plan of how the custodians of the ADMs are handling your uh, your infrastructure. Uh, so it's taking it uh, uh, part by part, analyzing the the risks associated with them, and always remembering that you know even when the, a scenario seems to be far fetched, that doesn't mean that it will not happen because again the attackers are always smart. Okay. Very, very good, good answer, Ben. Um, I think, uh, I mean, those were the two questions that we got from today. Um, I'm sure all the whole audience is uh, very thankful for the information that you've provided today. Um, ATMIA would like to um, thank you as well for sponsoring um, a webinar. Um, we have um, another few webinars um, coming almost on a weekly basis. Uh, sponsored by different um, ATMIA members. So if you'd like to um, continue to um, join our free webinars, um, please feel free to register. Um, um, yeah, so we would like to thank you, Ben, uh, very much for today. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing uh, the other uh, audience members uh, come on to the other webinars. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everybody, and keep uh, keep safe. Bye bye. Keep safe. Bye bye.